A portfolio, let's say of two components, A and B, add to 100%. So the fractions in each uh, add to 100%. And the return of the portfolio is a weighted average of the uh, weights uh, adding to 100% times their respective returns. And the risk of the portfolio, let's say here the variance, we'll take the square root later. Uh, I've given a memory trick here of extreme case of the correlation coefficient being 1 is the cross product of the weights and the respective standard deviations. And noting that the definition of a correlation is the covariance divided by the respective standard deviations, we can rewrite that so that it's the cross product weights times the standard deviations plus 2 times the weights times each other times the covariance. Well, some extreme computations will show that if they're perfectly positively correlated, that creates a linear combination between A and B. And if they're negatively correlated, they would create an extreme example here on this graph to the left of return and risk, and possibly creating a zero risk portfolio or something in between. Or we can take a more concrete example. Here, A having a return of 4 and a standard deviation of 2. Uh, B having a return of 12 and a standard deviation of 8. And the correlation coefficient between these two in this example is minus 1 half. Notice that A, lower in risk, lower in return, versus B, higher in risk and higher in return. Well, investors might just choose between the two given their risk return preferences. But Markowitz in 1952 noted that you could actually have a superior combination with regard to the less risky security. Let's do a numeric example. Here we have A and B, $1,500, $500, as to 2000 The weights would be 3 quarters, 1 quarter, adding to 1. There's the return, there's the standard deviations, and the correlation coefficient is minus 1 half. We compute the weighted average and find 3 quarters of 4 and a quarter of 12 makes a 6% return. And we compute the variance, uh, the weight squared times the variance added together, 2 times the cross product weights, and times the covariance. We find the variance is 3 and a quarter. And uh, we're not going to use the variance, we're going to use the standard deviation. So we're going to take the square root of that, which turns out to be 1.8. So when we go back to our graph, we find that the portfolio is comprised of a combination of the two. And now note this. This, pe this blew people's minds. The portfolio of these weights, 3 quarters, 1 quarter, has a return of 6 and a standard deviation of 1.8. And notice that this portfolio dominates, which is to say that it is preferred by all investors no matter what the risk return preference is, compared to the less risky portfolio. Well, that in of itself is profound. And we could even compute a least risky portfolio. And here again, we could take the portfolio variance. And noting that the weight in B is merely 1 minus the weight in A, substitute it. Uh, here we can rewrite it so that it's a little more uh, mathematic derivative friendly and take the first derivative with respect to the weighting. So we're trying to find the weight that gives the least risk here. And uh, in this case, setting that equal to zero. And then we solve for the weight that gives the minimum risk. And when we find that weighting, which is the variance of the other security minus the covariance divided by both variances minus twice the covariance. We get the weighting here, and I've done the computation using the same numbers here. We find that the weight in A that creates the least risk and the weight in B, which is the remainder from 1, adding to 100%, that we create an optimal portfolio. But this is only optimal if you're trying to minimize the risk to an absolute minimum. And indeed, we can take these minimal weightings. 
and uh, find out what we get, and we find out that there is a risk associated with those, the cross-product weights and the covariance, and we get the variance of the portfolio, and again, be reminded, we always take the square root of the variance, and we compute the return to the portfolio using these same weights that compute the minimum risk but the return here turns out to be, in this case, lower. And, of course, the risk is at an absolute minimum. And when we go to our graph, we find that, indeed, it's at the minimum in terms of risk. And notice this minimal risk portfolio dominates A, as it sometimes but not always does. And by dominating again, we mean that for all investors, given their risk-return trade-off preferences, that a, the less risky, lesser return security can be beaten by some other combination. Now, here's an example. I've used five securities. And E here in this peculiar case has the least return, the greatest risk, dominated by all other securities having greater return and lesser risk. But in terms of combining them together, the optimal portfolio, not a minimum, but the one that has combinations that give various trade-offs between higher returns and lower risks, that the weighting in E, while never very large, turns out that it is a necessary component of a optimal portfolio having higher returns and lower risk. And as you'll note here, you can probably see that given the combinations between each of them individually, that E has a profoundly negatively correlation with many of the other securities. It's not a great weighting. I like to make the analogy it's like putting pepper into soup. Necessary, but not too much. Dr. C invests.